Galatians chapter 3, uh, this would, is sort of what I would call Paul's personal argument. So we move into this next section here. Uh, <clears throat> so we take a moment to review, to remember what we have learned that we need to keep in mind. Moving into this uh, would be the main body of the letter, okay? So we know there's these false teachers, the Judaizers. They're preaching a false gospel. Uh, they're trying to mix law and grace, which then just nullifies it all, right? By doing this, perverts the gospel of Christ. So in order to discredit Paul's gospel, they have tried to undermine his authority as an apostle. Uh, his gospel then is, uh, they are saying, a second hand because the real authoritative uh, apostolic gospel comes from the Jerusalem apostles, Right. So Paul has given his defense by historical reports that his gospel and his authority are not from any man, but by the revelation of Jesus. And there is a deep uni uh, unity of theology and faith between him and these other apostles. All right, so as we know then, uh, the false teachers are trying to mix that long grace, as I said, teaching it is not enough that just to trust in Christ by faith alone for righteousness. Trusting in what Christ did for you has to be supplemented by what you can do for Christ. So it's God's work plus your work that will equal a justification in your life. So the Judaizers required circumcision. There was dietary restrictions uh, and keeping feasts and holy days as we'll see later in chapter four. And, and at least implied that by these works that the Galatians, right, or anybody who is not Jew could contribute their part to the transaction that's being had here for their justification. So Paul's laid out his defense and proof, right? So now he's going, he addresses the readers with some questions that are asked in a tone of a rebuke, okay? So he's confronting them head on again, just like he did in, ch in chapter 1, 6, when he's like, I'm amazed here at how fast you would depart. And here it's with their folly, their inconsistency of their behavior. And they have begun to be sucked in by the Judaizers. And Paul shows them that their action contradicts the work of Jesus on the cross and contradicts the work of the Spirit in their lives. All right, so um, we're going to read... We're going over one through five. I'm going to read to, to verse six for context. And uh, if you, an overview of chapter two will be released later today on the podcast. If you guys want to listen to that, it'll be out today. I was late. <laughs> oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. All right. Oh, foolish Galatians. <laughs> right? It's, he's rebuking. So in Galatians 1, Paul calls the believers in Galatia brethren, right? And the church, the ones that Jesus gave himself for to pay their sin debt. Now, here, he uses a little bit different language. He calls them fools. We don't say fool a whole lot today. Today it would be like idiot. Uh, it would. <laughs> so he's like, you idiotic Galatians. He calls them foolish, all right? Uh, the, the Greek, when originally coined for use, when this word, it meant to act as though the mind was inoperative. All right? Um, 
or, or worse, non-existent. The mind is just non-existent, okay? So this is a word that means to know the truth and to just simply act unreasonably or irrationally about it and just, just you just do the total opposite. So he says, who has bewitched you? Okay, so we got to take a moment here. The word bewitched, it would have had many uh, definitions, all right? Different, many meanings to the original audience, okay? Because it would have had its roots in the ancient Greeks of, and here's the main thing I'll focus on. It's a, an evil eye, okay? Which is obviously we're like, okay, that's weird. But it's an evil eye, right? There's a song called Evil Eye, too, right? Uh, <laughs> there is. I can't remember who sings it now. But this evil eye, right, these ancient Greeks, they were afraid of the ideal that a spell could be cast upon you or them by this evil eye. All right, so F.F. F. Bruce, he's a commentator. He stresses the nuance and renders bewitched as being, like, hypnotized. Okay, so the way to overcome the evil eye was to not look at it, which made me think of the Enderman, <laughs> Minecraft. Don't look at it. Uh, it. It so in using this phrasing, using that word picture, bewitched. Paul is encouraging the Galatians to keep their eyes upon Jesus, not upon the Judaizers or what everybody else is doing. He's also giving this idea that the Galatians then are under a type of spell, all right? But he doesn't mean literally, okay? Now, they're spells, we know this, but it, not in a literal sense. What he means is that their thinking has become so clouded, it's so confused, and, and because of that and because of what the Judaizers have come in with, it's become unbiblical that it seems that some kind of spell has just been cast over them. Right, so their mind's inoperative; it's non-existent. They're sort of just like uh, they're un they're they're bewitched. Okay, um, so he goes on saying that it was before their eyes. He says, "Your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified." Now that doesn't have to mean that they were actually there when Ju Jesus was crucified, uh, but publicly publicly portrayed. Um, is this Greek word which demonstrates how they had been given the truth. All right, So they didn't have to be there, but Paul had, been, had given it to them in such a way that it was, it was so convince, uh, convincing that in their minds they saw it for, for what it really was, the truth of it, the absolute truth. All right? So it, it's a way of saying, this is the point, guys. I publicly portrayed to you like I had like I had a sign I put it up on a billboard for you guys that Christ was crucified right it was Christ crucified for our sins and it, he he preached he ministered in such a way that it was as if they had seen it when it happened and he's saying I told you that that is the basis upon which you are saved this is salvation by grace through faith and this has been the theme of this, this whole, the whole time, right? Justification. Paul says, you knew that. You saw it. You heard it. I presented it to you. I stated it very clearly in your presence. So let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In verse 2. So he's presenting this question which is forcing them to choose between two options, all right? Even though they have three now, it seems, all right? There's the law, and there's grace, and then there's a mixture of both, okay? But there are two. There's only two options that are given uh, as a way to salvation uh, to them, achieving or believing, right? Which has Paul made his case for? Believing. He's forcing them to choose to look at this. Remember, they were not denying that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, right? But they were adding the law as a requirement to their salvation, right? If they really wanted to be saved, if they really wanted to be justified, they would have to do all these things now. So when Paul says that receiving the Spirit 
he's he's talking about being saved all right it's uh, a synonym for salvation all right this receiving the spirit so we go back to some of the gospel the basics right we are saved by faith ephesians 2 8 through 9 for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not as a result of works that no one should boast right and then we receive the Spirit by that faith. In Acts eleven fifteen 15 through 17, it says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon, upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God therefore gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Remember, uh, note here, he left out fire. <laughs> John the Baptist said, right, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit, good, fire, bad. So just make that point. So Peter here in Acts, he's preaching the gospel to Cornelius. And as he preaches, uh, God, God grants him that faith to believe. And then the Holy Spirit just descends upon him as, as, as it, the Holy Spirit did at the 120 at the beginning. All right. So notice that it, it isn't after they believed that they received the Holy Spirit. To not have the Holy Spirit is to not be saved. Anyone that tells you any differently, they're wrong. Romans 8, 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. You receive the Holy Spirit when you're saved. So saying, well, you're all right right now, but you need, now you've got to get this and go through this and do these things, and then you'll be saved. Like, not, it doesn't work, all right? These things here that I've laid out, that's salvation one-on-one, okay? When Paul talks here, again, about receiving the Spirit, okay? We'll go back to, to two. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of the faith? Were you saved, okay, that's what he's saying. What he's, he's talking about being saved. Again, it's a synonym for salvation. Were you saved by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Okay. It's very consistent with Galatians 2.20, which says that I have been crucified with Christ, but the life I live now is not my own. We saw last week. So Paul is asking them, did you receive the spirit by faith or by your law keeping? Which one is it? Are we saved by what we do? Or are we saved by what Christ has done for us? So just keep that in mind as we work through that middle section, this middle section, section of the book. All right. Every verse, every argument ultimately makes its way back to the core issue. Faith versus works. Grace versus the law of Moses. The very heart of the gospel is, is at stake within this discussion that Paul's laying out. So because Paul and the Galatians both knew that the gift had been bestowed upon them at the point of their belief in when the message was heard, this was all Paul needed to say to, est to establish just once and for all that salvation is by grace and not by any works of the law at all. So... Here they're, he's just sort of right there. Like, here it is. You guys should know this. So let's put the two up, see which one, how they contend. Grace wins, right? So <clears throat> you have these Galatians, right? These young believers there. They have been saved under Paul's teaching that one gets right with God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, right? But now they're being told by the Judaizers that good works and law keeping must play a much larger role within their theology. 
This is why they're confused. This is why they're bewitched. All right. So this new teaching tempted some to change their thinking about sanctification or their spiritual growth. Uh, they they m- might continue, and this I think this applies is applicable today. They will continue to hold to salvation by faith, but then they accept sanctification by works. So again, a mixture, right? And to this is verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? All right, so the Judaizers were saying, okay, even though you have been saved, right? Now that you have been saved in order to perfect that, let's work on it. In order to bring it to a completion, you got to do this, all right? Paul says, that's idiotic. (laughs) Why would you do that? Why? That's foolish. He says, you have a mental problem if that is what you think. That's literally what he's saying here when you break it down. Like, that's stupid. Remember the end of of chapter 2 last week? Like, Christ would have just died for no reason then. Right? Right? So he says, are you so foolish? Are you so idiotic? How could the law, which was unable to accomplish salvation in the first place, now bring about practical holiness in your life? So the contrast between beginning with the Spirit and trying then to attain perfection by the flesh, it sets up this whole... uh, uh, antithesis uh, between spirit and flesh which reoccurs in this letter and we'll see it in four in chapter five and then again in chapter six to live by the flesh is depending upon the resources and the abilities of the physical body or your humanness okay and a lot of us we use flesh in different ways I'm not going to get into that but just NIV had mis, uh, incorrectly tran- uh, mistranslated flesh and the use of it in the Bible in the early 80s. I think it's corrected now. But a lot of it, uh, there's a lot of flesh, like, oh, it's just my flesh. And, and I think most of the time we're correct in how we use it. But what I just said, to live by the flesh is depending upon your resources, your abilities of your, either your physicalness or your mind, your mentalness. Your humanness. You got to do this. It's me. I have to do this, right? Oftentimes we find ourselves trying to do these things in our own strength and then go, ah, why didn't I just give, you know, let go and let God, right? <laughs> Is that the, right? We got to do that, right? But that's the thing, the flesh, okay? So to live by the Spirit then, right, is depending upon the resources and, and the abilities of the Spirit. Whom God gives by grace through faith, okay? Now, in both cases, the fundamental issue there is what? Dependency, right? The critical difference is the object of dependence. Which one are you dependent on? You or the Spirit, okay? So in living by the flesh, living by your works... The person who is living is depending upon what they, right, what he or she is and has as the result of their physical heritage, which is intelligence, education, etc., and the things they know about the law and keeping the laws and the rituals and the traditions of men and so forth and so on, right? In living by the Spirit... The person who is living is depending upon what the Spirit of God is, who He is, and what they have, and what God has promised to do through them, right? So it's that whole issue of the object of dependence that reveals whether a person is living by the Spirit or by the flesh. The point of the verse is that you must go on in your Christian life the same way as it began, the same way that it started, 
It was faith, right? Since we began by the work of the Spirit, we must go on relying on the Spirit. You cannot grow in the Christian life by works, by drawing on powers in yourself to make your contribution to your salvation or to keep you in God's grace. We should know this by now. There's not, you know, and maybe you do. I just, us is general, okay? <laughs> I'm not hitting you guys. Uh, we should, not, like, there is nothing that I can do to maintain, attain, or keep myself in God's grace. It's not happening. I can't do it. I could be the good Sunday school Christian boy, you know? Go to, go to church every time the, door, the doors are open. You know, give my money, give my time, do these things, read a devotion, spend this much time in the Word, spend this much time in, in prayer. All those things are good. There's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't make me any better in my standing before God. People want to say it does, but it doesn't. We're all equal, remember? Remember I always say that? We're equal. <laughs> You don't have to glow in the dark, you know? You don't have to look at so-and-so on YouTube and why can't I be like that? Because you're not him, that's why, <laughs> right? So we depend on the Spirit. So even in the prayer and the fellowship in our own time, even in the study of the Word, it, even if you're just sitting and reading it, right? Study in the Bible doesn't mean you have to have three different resources out in front of you with the Greek and the Hebrew and uh, all these commentaries, okay, that's me because my job is to understand it a little bit better to make it simplistic for you, okay? <laughs> that's for me and that's for some of the people that are acad in academia and things like that. Just reading the Bible and reading the Bible alone and going through it is going to help you understand God better. It's going to help you understand the things that we talk about, the types and shadows, all these things, and it, that helps you just mature. So does that maturity make you closer to God? Does it make you, it, it makes you closer to God in your relationship. So let me rephrase it. Does it make you closer to God than uh, Paul here who never opens the Bible and never reads, doesn't even pray? <laughs> As far as positionally in Christ, it, no, it doesn't, right? And that's my point. That, that's his point here. Doing these things to achieve something on the merit of, I want more rewards in heaven. It's like, oh. like to me, I just don't get into that part. But the person who, is, who gets saved in this way in Salvation 101 and the basics and they just sort of just going and flip-flopping around for a while like a fish out of water and does that for several years. And the guy who just goes straight into to seminary and mm, is writing books and all this stuff and he's just making these theological, like, you know, trails and stuff. Like, who's closer to God positionally? They're both there, right there, the exact same spot. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, personally, in your relationship and knowledge and understanding and growing and just the prayer and the fellowship and the, the worshiping, people are all different sorts of levels on that. But we're all equal in Christ. We're all equal in that positionally. Okay? All right. Did you have a question? Okay. Okay, so... <clears throat> To live by the Spirit of grace is to live solely by the merit of Jesus. That's it. To live by grace is to base my entire relationship with God, including my acceptance and my standing with Him, on my union with Jesus. That's it. Right? A Christian realizes that they are justified, they are declared righteous. They are holy. They are blameless. There's no condemnation. And this is solely on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus that's been imputed to them by God through faith, right? 
I said some of that last week, the imp- being imputed. You're born a sinner because of Adam. Now you are justified and declared righteous because of Christ. So the Bible teaches that you are already holy. You're a saint, right? Because Christ's holiness is imputed to you. You have been made perfect forever. (laughs) Eternal life, okay? So this is positional sanctification. But then it teaches that you are being made holy day by day through the work of God in your life. And that's what I was, I tried to, that's what I was separating to make clear. That's your practical sanctification. Both acts, aspects are gifts of God's grace, right? We begin in the spirit. We are perfected in the spirit. Both come to us by God's grace because of what Christ has done. And that's it. Not, nothing of what we do. Verse 4. Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. So since the verses before and after verse 4 speak of the gift of the Spirit uh, and the, the occurrence of miracles, it seems that Paul is asking them if all of these uh, spiritual things have not had a positive effect in their life. Their acceptance of the message of the Judaizers makes Paul wonder whether they have learned anything at all from from the great things that's been happening that God has been doing in their lives and in their midst. Of what value is the gift of the Spirit if you strive for perfection without the direction or power of the Spirit? All right? But Paul cannot accept that God's gracious provision of the Spirit and his miraculous work will be in vain. So he adds that disclaimer at the end. If indeed it was in vain, such a great experience of God's work cannot be for nothing. Right? You tie that together again with the end of what we saw last week. Then Christ did, I mean... Christ isn't the minister of sin, right? If you guys could have obtained all this stuff doing all these things, then why did Christ die, right? So again, none of this, right, could be done for just no reason. God's work can't be for nothing. It's not in vain, all right? So does does he, he, in verse 5, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith. So he's, he's still, you got the two again. Here they are. All right, verse two was in past tense, all right? That's how we began. Let's go back and look at it. Did, right? Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now verse five Does he who supplies the Spirit to you? This is present tense. He's talking about experience and living your life uh, in the life of the Spirit. Now, provide here was used in, in marriage contracts to express the husband's commitment to providing faithful and generous support for his wife. So God is the faithful husband caring for his bride. The experience of God's uh, continuous and generous supply of his spirit to the Galatian believers is linked with his work of miracles that is happening in their midst. So Paul's argument in these five verses is this. If a person has received salvation through faith in Jesus received the fullness of the Holy Spirit at the same moment and has the power of the Spirit working within them, how could he ever improve on that by trusting in his humanness or his own efforts? You can't. (laughs) You can't and you would have to be a fool to try or to think so. Or an idiot. Right? So these people were slipping into legalism fast, and many do today, and we need to protect ourselves from falling into this as well. It's very easy. 
It's so easy to do that. To guard against legalism, we have to start with the right view of God. Then we have to gain a clear understanding of the doctrine of grace. And and that is the goal through this entire letter of Galatians. God is gracious, right? He's really gracious. He's not just a God of grace when it comes to salvation. He's, He's always has been and is and will be a God of grace, the only way he deals with his spiritual ch- children is through that grace. And it, it's a combination of all the attributes. His wrath his, and his anger will never touch those who are his by faith in Christ. He accepts you when you perform, right? <laughs> when you perform. And he accepts you when you don't perform. He wouldn't love you any more if you were absolutely perfect, which you are in Christ, or he would nor any less if you were just a horrid, awful person <laughs> spiritually. He doesn't love you more. He doesn't love you less. You cannot earn God's favor by what you do because you already have God's favor because of Christ. So don't be an idiot. That's what I ended with. <laughs> don't be a fool don't be an idiot that's the point here so are there any questions comments disagreements 